Welcome to Cynical Celluloid, the home, nay, church of horror delights. This second episode of the Exorcist sequel Retrospectus takes us back into the mind of William Peter Blatty with his return to the Exorcist story, and what a mind it is. The evil is back, and this time it wears many faces, as the Legion bring an unspeakable horror into a dark, dark world. Exorcist 3 Georgetown, 1990, and the 15th anniversary of Father Damien Karras' death is nearing while a macabre series of crimes is happening. Lieutenant Kinderman finds confounding evidence at the scene suggesting different killers on each occasion, while other, more disturbing clues strongly suggest otherwise. With the killings bearing the hallmarks of a notorious serial killer, hallmarks known only to the police, Kinderman becomes drawn into a very dark world of brutal supernatural murder that threatens to bring the most nightmarish death to his friends and family. With the intense investigation leading to the local hospital, and more specifically the geriatric and mental ward, he comes face to face with a patient who's not just your average crazy guy. In fact, he's somewhat disturbingly familiar in more than one way. Claiming to be the recently executed Gemini killer, it seems impossible for him to have committed the murders. But he knows way too much to not be the killer. Who is this man, and what can stop him? He carries more than one face. He is many. He is Legion. Oh, gracious me. Was I raving? The Exorcist 3, directed by original Exorcist writer William Peter Blatty and adapted from his sequel in novel form, Legion, is, for me, the true Exorcist movie sequel, over and above The Exorcist 2, which runs more like an Exorcist-themed movie. And if John Borman thought the original was mean-spirited, then he would certainly have a rough time with this one. Well, maybe that's being a bit reductive. The story is one coloured by the POV of a particular character who sees the world in the ugliest way for the most part. But more on that in a minute. You know, I've been thinking, Lieutenant. This is new. Do we really need prints from the inside of the sliding panel? I mean, all you're going to get are the prints of the priest. Yes or no? And what's the point? I'm padding the job. Exorcist 3 is a film of high contrast in almost every respect, and we'll start with the central character, Lieutenant Kinderman. Played by George C. Scott, Kinderman is a character who we could easily take against, considering he's a savagely cynical man to the point of coming over as an angry Rottweiler to almost everyone that he has contact with in his work. His few friends don't fare much better, but know him well enough to be able to accept him and play along knowing that underneath the bluster is a good man who, as much as he tries to hide the trauma his job exposes him to, is having to bury a lot of grief and horror at what he sees. He argues against a god, though he seems more disenfranchised than atheistic. He rails against his often even more cynical colleagues with dubious points of views, whilst using police vehicles as a fast form of taxi. Or indeed his badge as a way to get a free ticket at the cinema. Suffice to say, he's a complicated character. Other aspects of the film that feature a strong contrast are things like the slipping between reality and dreamlike sequences, a soundscape which goes from near silence to full on nightmarish drones. I've been waiting for you, Lieutenant. I wanted you to see this. <laughs> There's legitimate comedy. Most notably, but not exclusively, the banter between Father Dyer and Kinderman. So many things deliberately clash against each other, and it's actually really impressive that it works. The fact that it's a more natural narrative sequel to the original Exorcist, The Exorcist 2 could have been an entirely standalone film with a few changes in my opinion, is less important than the thematic elements that make this a far more cohesive continuation of the story. The Exorcist themes of testing and regaining faith are very much present here. Kinderman, like I've mentioned, has lost his faith to the horrors that he's had to face and he's replaced it with a cynical front that slips from time to time. Here he's faced with the embodiment of evil that revels in cruelty, pride, malice, and worse still, 
it wears his friend's face. The test of faith is on full display in the interrogation scenes, in which a double-hander of Jason Miller and more notably Brad Dorith lead Kinderman from a position of nihilistic cynicism to facing his own demons. These thematic continuations are really the essence of what made the original Exorcist such an enduring story over just being an enduring piece of cinema. This is a very psychological POV based film. Everything we see is coloured by the way Kinderman sees the world himself. In this scene we see his daughter looking like she's sleepwalking, reflecting the way that the patients at the hospital move to some extent. There is a suggestion that this affliction of evil permeates the entire world. And that's also something that the soundtrack intensifies with the coming and going of this ominous rumbling. It's like everything, everyone, and everywhere, there's this invisible but omnipresent threat. It's made almost tangible in the way that the film is constructed. The shocking thing about this is that the horror of the film is almost entirely off screen in that it shows very little in the way of visual brutality. Aside from the occasional jump scare, which are thankfully less in number than they could have been, I'll talk about that a bit more in a bit, the horror is largely delivered through the reaction and description of the aftermath. With that mostly detached police business-like approach to the horrors of humanity, we get plenty of detail to set our minds and hearts running. In some respects, it's not the kind of film a more contemporary audience would appreciate as much. Its style is much more of the 70s horror scene than it is of the current scene. It's not a gory film though, it does have some of the most harrowing horror of any horror film I know in how detailed the crimes are laid out through the dialogue. And this really highlights the nature of this film. It's a writer's film. It sounds obvious, I know, it's written and directed by the novelist Blatty himself, but when I say this I mean it in terms of this is how a film turns out when it's driven by words the exact same way that a book is. It's a film that's made like a novel. Dialogue heavy, favouring description over depiction, and hugely character centric. Blatty made something akin to an audio visual book with Exorcist 3 than a Hollywood film. This isn't the sort of thing that would likely resonate with a more casual audience, but I can confidently say this. It will work for anyone who absorbs their movies the same kind of way that they do a good book. I think this is why it's not had nearly the acclaim that the original Exorcist received, where Friedkin made a very cinematic movie, one that was instantly recognisable as a mainstream kind of movie. Obviously, he's a film director of some note and talent. Blatty, on the other hand, well, this was an extension to his work as a writer, and he made the film drawing heavily from his own discipline and approach. So yeah, in many ways, this is just as horrific a film as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, just without the gore. Not that that one even had that much. Its tension is equal to that film though, and others, and in some ways, it's more painfully and consistently sustained throughout the film. And what's more shocking about this film is it also manages to find the time, and will, to have a sense of humour. Yes. I haven't had a bath for three days. I can't go home until the carp is asleep. <laughs> because if I see it swimming, I'll kill it. I honestly don't remember too many films that have as finely honed ability to go from outright comedy to abject horror as deftly as this one. The knife configuration though does have some elements of this, but that's for the next review. From Kinderman's utter contempt and loathing for the carp that's been swimming around in his bathtub for the last week, to the wonderful banter between Kinderman and Father Dyer throughout their scenes, or even the almost Pythonesque characters like the so nurse. Cool. You treat your own family like this? Aren't you leaving? Please leave, I cannot wait for you to leave! Issuing a clear invitation to it's honestly astonishing how often The Exorcist 3 can make you actually laugh out loud. But how does it do that and then not kill the horror of what's going on? Well, I suspect it's as much to do with Blatty's sense for the absurd and how straight-faced he makes it. Aided by some incredible actors, these scenes are not played with a wink, 
they're played as if everything is just normal. It's all straight face. Well, mostly the scene between Ed Flanders and George C. Scott, where he describes his loathing for the fish that I mentioned earlier, sees Flanders losing his shit and unable to contain himself in the face of the epically grouchy Scott musing on the murdering of his Piscian nemesis. Seriously, these two guys had incredible chemistry on screen and the film should be seen for that alone. Which is what makes all their later scenes that more heartbreaking. When it comes down to it, Blatty, in comparison to Friedkin, always seems to me to be much more of an actor's director. Perhaps because he's so invested in the characters over the situation. Which leads nicely to the elephant in the room when it comes to this movie. The two versions. The theatrical version, the original release, was one that was forced by producer dictate to feature what they felt the audience demanded, an exorcism. I can actually understand and respect why they felt this. After all, The Exorcist 2 had failed in part down to it deviating quite wildly from the original film. There were other issues, of course, as I highlighted in part one of this miniseries, but many felt it wasn't really an Exorcist movie, much like me. I thought that it felt more like uh, The Omen Part 2, for instance. So Blatty had to add an exorcism into a film that hadn't really geared up to that narrative. And boy, oh boy, does it ever feel like it was forced in. As it stands, in the theatrical episode, there are clear reshoot inserts of a priest, Father Morning, in the film that just don't sit comfortably. They're disconnected from the rest of the story. And uh, they aren't too distracting until the point that the payoff happens and Father Morning bursts into the asylum like a godly Rambo to start an exorcism that had no lead-up. This said, I don't think the theatrical version is a bad one, not by a long shot. It's just that the inserted exorcism scene clearly wasn't supposed to be there. And of all the changes of this kind I've seen in movies throughout my 12 years writing about them, this one stands out particularly. Mostly because it feels like a huge spasm in an otherwise incredibly cohesive story. Up until this point, even the most Gilliam-esque weirdness works. We could even accept Fabio as a bloody angel while Kinderman tells a young boy with a roughly sewn on head that he's sorry he was murdered. Yeah, that happens. But it made sense in relation to the rest of what was going on and given who the story's point of view character was. The exorcism scene ends up feeling as bolted on as a cheap Halloween Frankenstein monster's head. That said, the exorcism scene is also a pretty damn exciting one. It just doesn't fit quite right for the film, especially with some of the gore that it throws in. In that regard, it feels pandering as well as out of place. I wouldn't be being entirely honest if I didn't bring up some of the really strange stuff. Things like statues reacting to things and... Other bizarre things that happen fleetingly throughout the film. It could come over as being a bit goofy to some. My acceptance of this is really down to the perspective of the film. It's a world where strange dreamlike things happen, and given, like I say, it's a film that views the world within it through a psychological lens, it has enough license to go to some very strange places. Like a hospital heaven with Fabio lurking around. It's not a realist world in any meaningful respect. It's more of an emotional one. And negative emotions at that. Of course, there is one other major change that the theatrical version made from Blatty's film. The inclusion of Jason Miller as Karras, back from the dead it seems, and sharing his torment with Brad Dorif. This change is the more successful one by far. Jason Miller puts in a fantastic performance here, and in fact his presence here makes it far more understandable why Kinderman reacts to the killer the way he does. It's one of those moments where the more cinematic approach of show-don't-tell works better, as in the Blatty cut he refers to Dorif's character as Karras, while the audience doesn't understand why that is. Like I say, Kinderman is the POV character, seeing Karras appear and have a... The killer change faces is perfectly fine in this context, as Kinderman sees the many faces of Legion, from the Gemini killer to his friend. The Blatty Cut is all Dorif, and as fantastic as his performance is, it's lacking that cinematic visual twist that keeps us seeing from behind Kinderman's eyes. And that's the rub here. 
neither version strikes me as a clearly superior version. Both have their pluses and minuses. The Blatty Cut has the meaningful extended character moments and far more natural if comparatively underwhelming ending, while the theatrical version plays a more cinematic and likely more satisfying game while displaying some not insignificant cracks in the demands of the reshoots. For first time viewers I would likely recommend the theatrical cut simply because it will play more towards a regular film going audience and there isn't enough damage done by the worst parts of the reshoots to make it a bad movie by any means. It retains most of Blatty's characterization and the real meat of his approach to the story that is far less a betrayal of his intent than it is a bit of a compromise. That plus Jason Miller's performance makes it very watchable. Way better, in fact, than many movies, and certainly any of the other Exorcist movies, possibly outside of the original. Though for my money, I tend to find this the most interesting of the films. It is fascinating on another level that you can see more clearly where Friedkin's and Blatty's work play out in the original once you see this. Things like the spider walk that was cut from the original until a later version you've never seen edition came out makes more sense when you contextualise it against how a similar scene works here. Blatty's more mind's eye approach to the story is in some contrast to Friedkin's more documentary style. Both approaches have validity, and it would have been interesting to see the original story directed by Blatty as a comparison. It's no secret that Blatty nor Friedkin appreciated Exorcist 2, and I do wonder if there was a few digs at that instalment in this. Kinderman's Heaven Hospital Ward dream sequence certainly has a Borman-esque tinge to it. It's absurd while still being relevant, and while it fits, it does have that Vaseline lens look to it that stands in contrast to the visuals of the rest of the movie. I'm curious as to whether Blatty wrapped it up in part as a parody of the first sequel, and uh, for another thing, Borman's Goodness Wins approach to its film seems to have been contradicted by Blatty's far more downbeat, bittersweet ending here especially in his original cut that sees Kinderman pretty much walk in and execute the killer. Sure, good wins here, whatever that means when it comes to Kinderman. He certainly isn't a pure man. He's at least lightly corrupt. He's soul-crushingly cynical. And as his I Believe monologue in the reshoot states, he's a man that sees little beyond the darkness and filth of the world outside of his family and his small circle of friends, who have been threatened or killed at this point. Does Kinderman win? Evil may have been defeated, but did it lose? He just shot a man, as far as the rest of the world may be concerned, in cold blood. On a lighter note, though, Blatty even refuses to utter the name Pazuzu. Friend Father Karras expels certain parties from the body of a child. Certain parties were not pleased. To say the least. To say the very least. The Exorcist 3 can be a bit of an odd beast, though. There's little doubt that it wasn't exactly destined for a mass mainstream audience acceptance, but it does have an avid cult film fan base. Maybe that's good enough. Suffice to say, though, I think it's a fantastic film in either form. It does have some minor problems, though, mostly in the occasional misjudgments from Blatty as a director. As I mentioned earlier, Blatty directed much like he writes, lots of character interaction. And when he steps outside of this, he does use some horror film cinematic cliches with a heavy hand. Jump scares are one thing. Though thankfully they're not consistent, they do intrude and come in varying levels of success. On the lose end of the scale is when Kinderman finds himself wandering around on a balcony where the lights are failing and we get a real cheap shot jump scare. And then there's another one involving a nurse checking in on rooms. Can't get any sleep. What the hell do you want? Though with this latter one, it pays off in supreme style with one of horror's most effective jump scares. The nurse wanders around doing her job for what seems like several minutes, locks the door behind her, and then this. <laughs> <laughs> 
can be argued that the earlier Grumpy Doctor jump scare bolsters this one, but the long, slow scene that continues on from there is a masterful example of how to capitalise on that and then deliver the perfect jump scare. Frankly, though, the wins in this film are far ahead of any missteps. The character of the Gemini Killer, played by Brad Dorif, is a wonderfully terrifying creature and clearly a master of manipulation. He embodies the worst of humanity and even manages to subvert several characters along the way, including the Doctor looking after him. It's a truly chilling performance from Dorif, who channels every ounce of rage and malice that he can muster, and it's backed up by some wonderful writing and a fantastically focused story. He cuts what is for me one of the all-time great horror villains with his magnificent portrayal of utterly malignant evil. I really can't gush over the performances enough in this film. George C. Scott, Jason Miller, Ed Flanders and the supporting cast all bring so much to this, even in the more eccentric moments. It's probably fair to say though that The Exorcist 3 carries a tone and visual style that isn't of your mainstream film. Personally, I think that's absolutely a bonus, but it's not like it'll sit as well with your average viewer. There's strange feeling cinematography, it sits strategically throughout the film, in the form of very hard focused and desaturated colours, long takes, strange angles, and lighting that ranges from very cold and flat to overtly stage style lighting. Like so many things about the film, Blatty and his creative team managed to make this work though, despite it all being quite disparate on the face of it. Couple the adventurous filmmaking with these incredible performances and an occasionally weird though uncomplicated story that runs deep and with purpose, and I have to say this. In many ways, this is the more accomplished film than the original. At least if you're given to prioritising a character-based story. That's not to say that the original Exorcist wasn't. It was written by Blatty as well, after all. But The Exorcist 3 really takes time to let the characters shine through so much brighter. I like it because it feels more personal. Because I can feel Kinderman's world. Because it's genuinely scary, often funny. And it didn't just rest on the laurels of the originals, like the prequels did. If you haven't seen it, then by all means give it a chance. It's quite the experience.